and I'm amazed because of all the things I expected to learn about this A3, it wasn't the Hello guys and welcome to this Volks Wizard video and in today's video I want to share with you my thoughts on a very important new car and that's the brand new Audi A3 Sportback. Now this car was launched in the UK just a few weeks ago so I'm very very lucky to have it so early so big thanks to Audi UK for the loan. I've had it about six days now and I think I've got to know it quite well. Now the reason I wanted to make this video was because a couple of months ago I made a couple of videos on the Golf 8 and they've done over a hundred thousand views and I feel that this car is actually the Golf 8's biggest rival. Now this car's got rivals from BMW and Mercedes but it's the interaction between the Golf and the A3 that's quite fascinating and I just wanted to share with you my thoughts on that. Now unfortunately I don't have a Golf 8 here to compare it with directly but if you want to watch the two videos I made I'll put links in the description below after this video go and watch those and you can see how the Golf 8 and the new A3 compare because whilst they're very very similar they're also very very different but what they do have in common is actually quite a similar list price now in this video we're going to look at the exterior styling we're going to look at the interior and we're going to look at the technology within there as well and then of course we're going to go for a drive firstly we're going to do my standard economy drive to see what kind of mpg we can get out of this very clever tsi evo engine and then we're going to do the bit i like the most we're going to go and drive it dynamically on some wonderful country roads and then hopefully come to some conclusion anyway without any further ado let's have a closer look at the brand new audi a3 sportback Okay, let's get the ball rolling then by talking about the exterior design of the new Audi A3 Sportback. Now, like a lot of areas, design is a very subjective thing, but I've been keeping an eye on what you guys have been saying on social media, and I think it's been pretty well received, unlike, for example, the Golf 8. And that's really because it's not a particularly revolutionary design. There's a lot of hints of the old A3, and to my eyes, it's just an upscaled A1 in many ways, which is no bad thing. And the link with the old A3 is probably stronger on this car because it's in Daytona Grey, which goes back about 15 years. So it's a £575 option, and it's been in the range such a long time because the design chief, Mark Lichter, loves the colour because it shows off the shape of the car, and there's a lot to show off on the new A3. So let's start at the front then. OK, we've got a much bigger grille and a couple of fake grilles either side of it, which are clearly trying to impress people in the far eastern markets where these cars sell in great numbers but on the s-line i think it's okay and as an overall design it works pretty well another option i should point out is that we've got the 675 pound matrix led headlights which have got this trick array of 15 leds here and as well as looking cool they also operate in a more advanced way so you've got a main beam that only switches off the bit of the main beam that will affect oncoming traffic rather than just switching it all off so they're worth 675 pounds of anybody's money particularly if you drive a lot at night the bonnet's quite interesting it's got five sections to it so one two three four five but i think the biggest change is down the side of the car where we've got this massive concave section in the doors so there was always a bit of this on the old car but it's now probably two to three times bigger than it used to be which gives the car a very athletic stance well i say stance but actually it makes the wheels to my eyes look a bit undernourished they're really set into the arches and we've got quite a high ride height here which considering the car's actually lower than the old one is a bit surprising this car was dropped off by some guys in an Audi RS Q3 and I'm pretty sure the ride height of that was lower than this. I must go and measure an old S-line and see what we got, but we've definitely got an easy three fingers there. Hopefully with the RS3 and even the S3 they'll fill the arches a bit more convincingly. We've got this sill extension here which is in a sort of titanium colour which matches the grille surrounds there. And the wheels which I think might not be available in the UK because this is a very early car are £145 and I think compared to what we've had before with Audi wheels they look pretty good it's nice to see some titanium back on those too at the back the wheel arches are very bold imagine what it's going to be like on the RS3 if they're already like this on the standard car I said that about the A6 and well you know what happened to the RS6 
at the back again it's very a1 but it works pretty well we have got quite a bit of honeycomb fakery here which has always been an s-line thing to be honest since the facelift of the 8p version we've got another grill here that houses a parking sensor and a bit more titanium there which should be a bit more obvious on a car that's not already grey yep we've got some trapezoidal fakery with the exhaust tips there but that's just the way it is unfortunately hopefully when the more powerful versions come out we'll have something a little bit more convincing down there so overall i think it looks pretty good particularly in this lovely daytona gray right then now time to have a look inside where there are some significant changes okay guys welcome to the interior of the brand new audi a3 sportback now before we talk about it let me just say this is an s line model it's twenty seven thousand two hundred and seventy five pounds on the road beneath this in the range we have the sport and the technic the range starts just over twenty three thousand pounds and it seems to be pretty close to golf so if you had this engine which is a 1.5 tsi 150 petrol with a manual box in a golf r line it would only be about 500 pounds less than this car which is food for thought but you do need to have a look at what you get a standard on each car because you might find the a3 could actually be cheaper than the golf once you expect the golf to have bits this car has like this car's got 18 inch wheels golf only comes on 17 so that's probably that difference gone straight away Right, now, this has been a very hotly discussed area of this new car, and for good reason, because there are three areas in which it's quite different. So we have quality, design, and technology. It sounds like a, something I used to do at school, that. So let's firstly talk about quality, then. So the A3, especially the last one, when I'd get into one of those, I'd be like, wow, this is easily the best MQB platform interior I've ever been in. It's so much better than Golf 7.5, and that's not a bad interior even smelt luxurious i know that sounds stupid but it smelt amazing particularly with leather now it doesn't have that air of five-star luxury about it unfortunately the a1 was always a lower grade of plastic and interior quality generally i felt and that was right for its target audience because it was a polo rival which again was not as good inside as a golf well now there is a hint of a1 in this interior in the quality of the plastic so for example have a look at that door card there so it's a lot a lot of a lot of very grainy scratchy plastic that's actually padded there but we've got ambient lighting there to break it up although ex the extended version in this car is an extra cost option of 110 pounds and the door handles you know very audi but down here this is probably the most disappointing bit where they could have put something in that speaker grill or above it to make it look better i think that's probably reserved for the b and o pack that comes as part of the comfort and sound pack for 11.95 so if you do get a jazzed up door speaker yeah that's definitely worth paying for the comfort and sound pack which also gives you parking system plus rear view camera and heated seats okay quality yeah so i mean you know you've got to bear in mind you have the quality of the interior plastics and materials but you also have the way the car's assembled and i've been with this car now for a whole week and it's never really made me doubt the way it's built so let's distinguish between the material quality and the build quality build quality is spot on typical audi right then let's talk about design then so again another contentious area let's talk about these air vents then so they say they're they're very lamborghini but you know i buy an audi i don't want a lamborghini lamborghini is firstly design Audi should be minimalist Bauhaus. So on the Golf, the air vents are down here somewhere, probably where you haven't got climate control buttons. We'll come to those in a sec. And you think they're never going to work, but they do, and they're not in your face. These are in your face. And they do have a good secondary use, though. So it's very hard sometimes to find a flat surface to put a mug, and a mug doesn't really go in a cup holder very well, and sometimes I haven't got my thermal mug. So it's not all bad. Also, we've got this here, again, more air vents. It just reminds me of sleepless nights in hotel rooms looking at air conditioning units on the wall. It doesn't do anything for me from a design perspective. This, okay, is all right, it's just plastic. But why do I want to see the air vents like that? I don't know. Or it looks like a back of a computer where it, it's got a fan. Big step forward though is, uh, well, I think anyway, we've got rid of the rotary controller for the MMI and it's all touchscreen now. Yes, it's probably a little bit harder to use than the MMI, 
while you're driving but when you're not driving which i'm sure audi have checked is when most people use it it's brilliant so it's got a lot more processing power than the old one and it runs apple carplay really nicely although oddly you lose a haptic feedback when you get in this but uh yeah ways work so that means i'm happy but you're kind of missing the the full interface if you only use it through carplay so you get navigation standard there's actually quite a lot of standard on the uk version of the s line so you don't really need to spec an awful lot but yes you can pinch and do all that and it's really fast so that's the big thing another thing is you can set up different users so each user has their own navigation stuff that's so all custom to the user like and if you've got memory seats which this car hasn't again it remembers all the seating positions using the user's function We've got knobs on the climate control. Golf 8 haters rejoice. Luddites rejoice. Let's put that on. There is sort of one downside, and they had to do something to wind people up. And they, I don't think I've ever seen an air conditioning control unit that doesn't have blue or red on the temperature bits. So it's like, hmm. Yeah, but you do work it out, of course. But, you know, should it, should it say that so that one of these six users who doesn't drive it very often knows straight away how to operate it is tricky but these feel nice so yeah if you've got a craving for buttons with proper haptic feedback you'll be happy in this car which is really weird because Vorsprung Dirk technique doesn't seem to apply in this case the heated seats stay on seemingly indefinitely if you've if you've had them on so I came home last night turned it on this morning they were still on three so I thought I'd wet myself so that's something to look at for I never really noticed that on any other cars before we've got an old usb so vw decided that you're going to have usb c like it or not and i couldn't even charge my phone up but on this we've still got an old one and a new one which i think is pretty good down here again a slightly contentious volume control for the stereo but i actually like it because i've seen all these videos of people complaining and that's taught me how to use it and it's great i really like it okay yeah we could have a knob and do that but who wants something that looks like it's from a 1970s amplifier in the 21st century Audi? You know, this is what people want now. Right, let's see what else. Yeah, virtual cockpit is standard, so that's quite a big thing. It used to be optional on the old one. It's probably because it's cheaper to make this and configure it to each car electronically rather than make a different speedo, a different rev counter for diesel, petrol different markets whatever it's all one thing with a software splurge to make it work how you want it to but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's actually brilliant so again technology isn't there it's there to make stuff cheaper but also better flat bottom steering wheel is optional on this car it's 115 pounds if there's some driver assistance package that's optional fitted you can't have this because it's got sensors all the way around it so yeah you might miss that we've also got four-way lumbar support on the seats they are super comfy i'm not a huge fan of integrated headrests so again i think this is possibly to save money because if you think about the mechanism needed to make the headrest go up and down it's it definitely costs extra to do it i always think of volkswagen up when i think of these sort of tombstone seats but you know, you get this integrated headrest on some of the sportiest cars in the world, so I guess it's probably just me being a bit miserable. They call this twin leather, which is a bit of a misnomer, really, because this bit is not leather. And so what's the twin bit? Twin leatherette? I don't know. But this is the real leather, and it's not even particularly nice leather. So if you look at this, is this, is this fake as well? Is that the only leather bit? I don't know, because that looks worryingly like this, and this is not leather. So, yeah, I think on the old S-Line it probably was extra cost to have leather, but I don't think you get an awful lot of it as standard in this car, even though it might appear to. So look out for the legal cases against dealers that say this car's got full leather, because it hasn't. Then we've got the stitching on the dashboard, which I guess it's just there to be decorative. It doesn't actually do anything or join anything. And it is really stitching. I thought it was actually melted plastic, but no, it's 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 definitely stitched. But it just looks like something you'd come out of A and E with on a Sunday morning after a rather heavy night out. 
We've got a black headlining in this S line for a sportier look, including the pillar trims. And it's not particularly claustrophobic in here, even though it was all pretty black. The bright work on the dashboard does help rather a lot. I think it's stopped raining now, so let's have a look at the rest Your of the car. mobile phone is still in the vehicle. Oh God, I hate that. Okay, so it's, it's the same basic platform as the old A3, so there's not going to be an awful lot of difference. I'm not sure I've got the seats in the best position to demonstrate the rear legroom because I wanted to be further back to show you the dash. But even with that, I think fully back, I'm still relatively comfortable in here. But yeah, it's not too bad. I'm six foot and I, there's not an awful lot of headroom, which is probably how they made the car lower by reducing the rear headroom. But I'll be all right. Okay, let's have a look in the boot because when I did Golf 8, I forgot to look in the boot and somebody complained, which is probably fair enough. So I think it's about 380 litres. It's not going to be much different to the old car and apparently it's very close to the rivals from Mercedes and BMW and the Golf as well. So it's a good size. On this model, we've got the 40, 20, 40 seats which you may not think are that much better than 60 40 but i always found that on right hand drive cars the more usable bit which was the wider bit was behind the driver which meant that you couldn't really have a massive object and push the seat all the way forward because it would be affecting the way the driver sat so with this you don't have that problem the other thing to note is that this carpet isn't really as good quality as it used to be. I had a wheel in here on a on a blanket and it's marked it, which wouldn't have happened with a lovely rich pile of the old car. So this isn't going to wear very well, I think. And then underneath, it's a bit sad. So there's no spare wheel there, even though a uh, space aid would go in easily. You can even see where the, the bracket to mount it would be. We've just got tyre foam. So yeah. That's a bit of a shame, but I'm sure you can buy a space saver if you want one. But I'd definitely buy a load liner as well for this car because it will not wear very well at all. Right, that's enough of the interior now. Let's go and have a drive in the brand new A3 Sportback. OK, before we do the exciting bit where we test the handling of the new Audi A3 Sportback, we're going to do an economy drive. Now, this is the set route I do every day to work. It's 30 minutes, 25 miles, and I've done it in so many cars. I can really get a feel for what they do when it comes to real world fuel economy. It's quite mixed as well. So some country roads, we're doing a cold start and there's a bit of urban at the end of it as well. It's quite a long stretch of motorway. So pretty varied. And yeah, some cars can be very impressive like the ETSI Golf was. Now this is basically the same engine as the Golf, the, the Mark 8 Golf, but it doesn't have the mild hybrid thing. So it'll be very interesting to see how this 1.5 TSI Evo will get on. So. Without any further ado, let's go. So I'll reset the trip computer by pressing that button down. So short-term memory is clean. Let's get going. Temperature is 15 degrees, so probably a little bit colder than it was with the Golf, because that was in two months ago in mid-June. We've also got a manual gearbox, which shouldn't make too much of a difference but we won't have the coasting function that does benefit the DSG card when they're in the efficiency mode, which we're in. I'll just double check we're in efficiency mode now by resetting it, because it's hard to know sometimes if it's actually in full efficiency mode. So to keep as much of a level playing field as I can with the electronic cars, I'm changing up as early as I can do because they like to love to shuffle up to seventh as quickly as possible. I've also got something on here telling me that I should change gear to six because it's quite happy to do so. So if I follow that, we're pretty much following the mapping of, a, of an S-tronic gearbox in efficiency mode, although we don't have a seventh gear now. But it is a very long geared car, so at 60 miles an hour, it's doing 2,000 RPM, which is pretty good for a petrol car. So yeah, that, that does contribute to the MPG quite a lot. Plus, it's very tractable. It's not got a lot of go between 1,000 and say 2,000 RPM, but it will still pull in sixth gear 
on the flats when it's warmed up from a thousand without complaining which I think is is quite impressive and that will help economy we've also got a picture of a of a shoe with an arrow which confused me like hell till I looked it up in the manual but basically it means that looking at the navigation info it's telling you it's a good time now to come off the gas so forewarning you maybe of a junction which is pretty clever I suppose okay we're just about to get onto the motorway now we've we're showing 51.6 and I'm off the gas the car's rolling so easily even though it's in gear effectively and we just come up to 52.4 now so that's I think pretty good but as I said with the Golf motorways tend to kill MPG quite a lot depending on the car so we're gonna get up to 70 we're doing 50 now on the slip and then let's see what happens on the motorway so as we join the motorway by all these massive lorries we are on 52 so let's just get cruising okay so we are now 24 minutes and 21.7 miles in and the MPG is 53 0.7 it's probably a tiny bit higher than it should be because there was a bit of traffic which meant I had to do about 60 instead of maintaining a constant 70 but then I've had to speed up as well so it won't be too far off the ETSI Golf was probably in a similar position about now and being mild hybrid that won't make an awful lot of difference on a motorway because we're not coming off the gas that's where mild hybrid really does make a difference so stop start traffic it will be significantly better but this car's the same core engine which means that we've got the two cylinder mode so we get two of the four cylinders switched off when the car even on the motorway if you're going down a bit of a gradient and you're not under much load it will switch those two off which is pretty amazing right I'm just going to get into the left hand lane to come off now and then I'll come off the gas so 54.3 now I've got the slip road to go I'm in gear so I'm not coasting as I would be in an s car and the MPG isn't going up as much but yeah 54.7 so this is a 150 horsepower petrol engine with a manual gearbox and we've just done that now sitting on the motorway the average MPG at 70 miles an hour was 52 and it was going up a bit as well depending on the gradient of the motorway so it seems like at 70 miles an hour it will according to the trip computer do over 50 miles per gallon and bearing in mind the trip computer on this car and the Golf 8 which is the same platform car and to a degree the Leon which is still MQB platform uh, they're all pretty should all be pretty consistent so yeah that's impressive I probably should have come off the gas and had to start stop because we've lost a bit but anyway right let's do the last bit now so a bit of dual carriageway and then a bit of 30 Okay, well, here we are at work then. So let's have a look at the trip computer readings. Let's stop, start, <laughs> kick in so they don't change. 50 mile an hour average, that's pretty standard for my commute. We've done 26.2 miles, so a bit longer than normal, but there are two routes I take and I think I used the longer route last time. 31 minutes of driving, again, that's pretty standard. And 53.9 to the gallon so I mean this car's only done 2003 miles so it's still got potential to improve and yeah that's really impressive and I can tell you I've driven this car faster on on uh, on average on other roads and it will do still somewhere in the 40s on on the average kind of motorway driving so it is there or thereabouts the same as my lay on TDI 150 DSG was that's an estate car a little bit heavier but yeah that's pretty impressive as I said ETSI and the Golf 8 probably wouldn't have much of an effect on that journey because we're not stop starting a lot there's not much coasting there's not much you can turn the engine off for because we're moving along all the time but it still goes into two cylinder mode like the any 1.5 TSI Evo does so that will help with that figure which 
I think he's pretty damn good. Now, I've done my punishment. Let's go and have a bit of fun and go and drive this car in a more dynamic way. Okay, before we put the A3 through its paces on some country roads, there's still a few sensible bits to talk about, actually. So, firstly, the ride. Now, S-Lines have been famous for having a very firm ride, and I'm driving on this road because it's the bumpiest one that I drive on, and it's still pretty acceptable. And the good news is, as you get onto faster roads, the suspension sort of loosens up even more, so it's never wallowy or bouncy. It's always very, very controlled. It's just a, the perfect balance of ride and handling, even on these 18-inch wheels, which are standard on the S-Line. So there's no need to order passive dampers, I think, unless you live in a particularly bad area like Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, for example. That's really good news, and that means when you do get up to speed on a country road, you can really enjoy the handling of this car. Now, another thing is that we've got a manual gearbox in this car, which wouldn't be my choice for a daily driver. The S-Tronic, it's going to cost you probably just over a thousand pounds more, but it gives you a bit better integration with the other systems in the car. So if you order adaptive cruise control, it works better because it can change gear to suit the cruise control. It also works better with the efficiency program because you can have coasting. It will disengage the clutch to let the car coast, which will increase your MPG if you do a lot of that kind of driving. And it's also better with the electric parking brake really to have an automatic. It always seems a bit of a, it always has seemed a bit of an odd mix to have manual with electric parking brake. But it's not a bad gearbox, clutch is light, it's got quite, quite a long throw, but it's all right. You know, if you want a manual, then fair enough, it's not a bad manual. The engine. Okay, so you know its eco credentials are pretty good. It's basically, for my kind of driving, you know, it makes diesels redundant, which means you don't have to worry about it being banned by blinkered councils like the one in Bristol. But when it comes to enthusiastic driving, it's got 150 horsepower and it's got 250 newton meters of torque, produced quite low down in the rev range, but it's never a particularly enthusiastic car, particularly in fourth, fifth and sixth gear, which are particularly high. Okay, we're on a really good road now. It's 60 miles an hour. It's got some tricky corners and it's not a particularly brilliant surface, which would I'm sure be the undoing of an old S line. So let's see what we can do then. So we're in third gear and it's a bit flat initially, but at about 3,000 it does wake up and yeah if you work it hard it's a quick enough car for most people. I think S-Tronic would make what performance it has a bit more accessible but it's not a bad shift at all this really it's just that the upper gears feel a bit long and it takes a bit of rowing to get the best out of the engine but when you get to the corners my word It's unbelievable. It's so neutral and flat and it's just a very good balance of ride and handling. So, you know, it's not being bounced about on this road. I got room to manoeuvre around a jogger on a blind bend. It feels as good as a GTI, which is some praise, I think. You can easily enjoy it on a B road like this and I'm amazed because of all the things I expected to learn about this A3 it wasn't that it went round corners like a GTI but it does <laughs> wow okay it's now time to summarize what I think of the Audi A3 Sportback I like the design by and large exterior I think the interior is okay there are pros and cons over the old car I love the way it drives I think the economy of this 1.5 TFSI is pretty remarkable 
really and as a daily car for a bit of fun every so often it's surprisingly good the quality of mainly the interior will be a problem for some people but I pull into this road because it gives you a good example of what people really think of quality when it comes to buying expensive assets so we're in this new estate it's probably been built under a year I think and it's pretty well known that new houses are not built to a particularly high standard but people still buy them because they're other things that they prioritize over quality and that's the new a3 it may have gone down in other bits but you've got your lovely kitchen and bathroom which uh you know the real wow factor in the showroom and enhance your life every day rather than the quality of a bit of plastic down there which really doesn't make an awful lot of difference so yeah i think audi have nailed it and the golf is looking pretty weak at the moment especially when you consider the pricing i'd love to have a closer look at the price prices of the golf and the a3 and work out the equivalent cars and how much they come to because the options are a bit misleading i think because you could end up with some bits missing off this car like adaptive cruise that would then make it quite a lot more expensive than the golf but overall, yeah, I think it's a really strong effort from Audi and roll on the S3 and R3. Well, we've come to the end of this road. We've come to the end of the video. So, guys, thank you for watching this Volks Wizard video. As ever, if you've enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. Please comment, please share. Please, please do subscribe, and I'll see you for the next one soon.